Hello, everybody. Welcome to All Things Aviation. On behalf of the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation, I'm Vince Mickens, the Executive Director. Glad to have everybody on board with us this morning. Uh, of course, when you watch it on demand, it could be at any time. But, and we are live today on Facebook Live as well as the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation Facebook Live. Say that fast several times. Um, page. Uh, and also on the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation YouTube page live. So we're, we're doing a simulcast with this today and uh, we, uh, or can continue watching us here on Zoom. Again, welcome. And we have a great lineup of guests today. It's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I wanted to, it's funny, I, I had a, a conversation with somebody very recently and it kind of really set the tone for what we want to accomplish with this program. And that is, is um, in this case, I'll just tell you a little bit of a story. So there's a young lady who um, had all the aspirations of, of wanting to be a, an airline pilot. Uh, so she got her private while in high school. Um, so she, was, she started pretty early. She's from the Midwest in Kansas. And, and then she, you know, uh, went into an aviation program at one of the colleges there in, in Kansas uh, and was on her way. She's going to be an airline pilot and she, she had things planned out and all set. Uh, and then as she was completing her aviation education and flight training, the bottom dropped out in the economy. And she found herself in a position of saying, oh, airlines aren't hiring. What am I going to do? Uh, as it turned out, and to make a, a very long story a little shorter, she decided that she was interning um, in a situation that introduced her to aviation law. And she decided that, hmm, maybe this is a route I could take. So she decided to go ahead and, and pursue that and get her law degree. And at the same time, she was working for uh, an aviation law firm and it kind of all started to come together. Now, if she were listening right now or watching right now, she'd probably say, you just really messed that story up with the details, but you guys get my gist. Um, so, and then she, she started working in aviation law and she's built a career to where now she's a partner with the firm and she still flies. In fact, she said she flies a couple hundred hours a year. She has the um, 1946, uh, Lanscombe. Uh, that's her personal plane. And then uh, the, the firm has a, a, a plane that they fly and for business. And so between the two, she flies all the time. So my, I guess my point is, is she's still uh, fulfilling her passion of flying, not nearly the way that she thought she would. And I, I think that's just true in, in general with, with, uh, any situation with any career, but in particular with aviation, yes, there are some, like some of our guests that'll tell you about their track and how they were able to become a professional pilot and have a full career. That's our, our veteran guys on here. Uh, and then some who are just getting started and are evaluating, you know, what's gonna be the best route. Are they gonna go airline? They're gonna go corporate? Are they, are they gonna go another route altogether? Uh, we had a few guests on last week that because of COVID-19, they are going back to school and getting their master's degrees while they kind of wait it out and figure things out and that type of thing. So everybody has a, a, a path uh, that sometimes is one that's planned out and sometimes it's planned out for you <laughs> without your knowledge uh, until you're actually in it. So, um, but that's, that's really the epitome of what the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation's mission uh, and, and what the, as an organization, the, the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation was formed for and is representative of Bob Hoover himself, who wants to see the next generation continue uh, in aviation, uh, get into aviation, or if you're in it, uh, continue to grow in it, uh, grow into leadership positions, grow into positions of, of developing new technology and we've got a lot of that going on right now and just knowing about all of the opportunities that are that are available and that type of thing so let me introduce this great panel of guests 
Um, you, you see one of them, you're probably seeing his forehead right now. That would be <laughs> Captain <laughs> Stephen Walton. Uh, yeah. He's a he's struggling triple to seven captain, and now he's showing us uh, his ceiling fan. I guess, you know, once around propellers, always around propellers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's had a full career with American Airlines, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about that later as we get into the show. There we go. And then we Losing have power. we have Tamara uh, Cullum and Tamara. <clears throat> you know, yesterday we had our our pre-show meeting, and Tamara's like, "You yeah, know, is it okay if I do the meeting from a boat on the Potomac?" And we're like, "Sure, <laughs> if, if, the, if that works for you, it works for us." So we're jealous of her because she had a really nice time out on the on the water. The weather is appropriate for it. Uh, uh, early to mid nineties uh, and that type of thing. Um, Tamara is uh, a retired U S air force master sergeant. That's impressive in itself, but she uh, was uh, full speed ahead on air force one uh, as a flight attendant, one of the crew members uh, with a number of uh, political dignitaries over the, over many years, which she'll tell you a little bit more about. She's also an international business and etiquette consultant. Um, she's certified for that. Crew resource management, certified for that. And she currently is a contract corporate flight attendant. So she has a lot to contribute to the conversation in terms of things she's doing. So, um, and third, we have, <clears throat> excuse me. Third, we have uh, Zane Lambert. Zane is the manager of aircraft operations for Sanderson Farms. If any of you have been in the chicken department at a grocery store, you probably know the product. Um, he runs our corporate aviation department, and he'll have a lot to share with us from that perspective. And then we have three of our Bob Hoover Legacy uh, uh, Presidential uh, Scholarship winners, our, our recipients, I should say, um, at, who are all Embry-Riddle, both Daytona and Prescott. Uh, one's a graduate, the other two are uh, in their senior year, finishing up. So the first is Jan Bosch. Jan's the first officer currently for Delta Airlines. He graduated from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University at Daytona Beach. Uh, he is, as I mentioned, a recipient of the uh, Bob Hoover Presidential Scholarship, which was uh, provided on behalf of the Citation Jet Pilots Association and the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation. And we have Otto Maytag. He's a senior at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Prescott, Arizona. Um, and as a, a recipient of the scholarship as well. And third, we have Matthew Gailey. And Matthew is a senior at Embry-Riddle at Prescott, or as they, I heard them saying earlier, Riddle West. And, and I've heard a, a couple <laughs> other names for it. <laughs> so, so welcome everybody to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess what we can start out with, um, it's funny. I, you sometimes wish you could be live when you're on the, in the pre-show form because the conversation that was going on before we went live right up until about 30 seconds before we went live was pretty interesting hearing these guys talk back and forth amongst each other. So I hope we can recreate that as we, as we progress with the show. But why don't we start out a little bit um, and we'll, we'll start out with, we, we talk a lot about the airlines and we're going to do that again today, but I think, and, and, and about business aviation, but I think um, Tamara has a very unique background uh, with the Air Force, with Air Force One, flight attendant, uh, et cetera. So Tamara, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do or what you did and what you do now? And, and we'll kind of take it from there. Okay. So I, uh... In the Air Force, they have flight attendants, and a lot of people don't think about that. And we used to be a special duty, so you come in, you do two years in whatever the Air Force deems you need to be, and then you can apply to be a flight attendant. Uh, flight attendants in the Air Force and every branch has flight attendants, but the Air Force is unique to we support the president, the first lady, all our dignitaries, and Congress and senators. In retrospect, we learn to cook. We cook all the food, we prep it. Um, flight attendants load bags. That one I don't understand yet. We've been fighting that one. <laughs> I'm very good at Tetris. 
<laughs> but it's but it's a it's a great opportunity. You know, you, once you're in aviation, it's in your blood. You don't leave. There's four bases. We used to have six bases. You're down to four bases now. We have everything from. I started on a 707. I was going to say, how did, you, how did you even get involved with uh, Air Force One? I mean, that's that's special in itself that you would have that opportunity. I mean, that's a they're probably pretty selective about who they allow on that aircraft. They are. So you have to start on the other aircraft, the other squadrons, and you have to be able to get a clearance. And it's they ask you to come up and do an interview. So it's based on a lot of you have a good reputation of working hard doing you're good good at your job pretty much and they'll bring you up for they'll bring you up to fly they'll interview you and if you're willing and wanting to go up there because once you go up to that it changes it's a whole we call it behind the fence because it's a whole different get your clearance and that's your main focus is that one mission and not the other missions that are down there because you know now it's the president you're flying and it is a great honor it, you know it doesn't matter who's in office that's not what the crew looks at, at. It, you know it's that plane and who you're supporting because we're representing the united states it's like everything you're you're representing your family your friends everyone so it's very unique it's a very tight crew because we're together all the time, especially during campaign season, you're working 20 hour days. Wow. And, and, and kind of on call around the clock? Um, yes and no. Uh, the good thing about that going up to Air Force One, you know, you have a better schedule, ironically. You know, the president, he doesn't just take off on a normal basis. I mean, Sometimes you're told, hey, we're going to plan something and we're not telling you where, our, where you're going. Like when Bush went to Iraq for the first time. But it's still planned it's out. Very, what's that? I said it's still planned out. Yes. Yeah. Because of the security of it. Where at the other squadrons, a lot of times you never planned your life more than a day out. Because you always, you're always having a crew ready to go for, we support FEMA on anything you always had an alert crew and you're always pulling alert in case you needed to go so going up there you could plan your day out a little more except during campaign season so jan uh, i'm going to shift a little bit jan of, of the uh three of you that are here uh, on the show today you're uh, currently flying and you have been for a few years you've you've uh Tell us a little bit about your flying background and how things are right now with Delta, who you're currently a first officer with. Congratulations. Sure. So, uh, That's really great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be there. Uh, so I, I started, uh, my aviation career at Embry-Riddle, uh, much like Matthew and Otto. And, um, I believe Zane said he, uh, he went there as well, uh, back in the uh, Daytona beach campus. Uh, from there, I went to a Part 135 operation called Tradewind Aviation uh, down in the in the Caribbean, and um, <clears throat> that gave me good exposure to the corporate side of uh, of aviation. Uh, it was it was still scheduled uh, 135, but we did charter as well, and the interaction with the guests was definitely a lot more amplified than uh, I see at the airlines. Um, I knew that uh, from my exposure uh, throughout the early stages of my career, I, I wanted to at least give the airlines a try. And so I started, I uh, went to SkyWest Airlines. I figured it was the best, the best way to build uh, jet time quickly uh, was at, at a regional airline. So I went to SkyWest Airlines uh, based out of Los Angeles on the CRJ and flew in and out of Aspen, Colorado, which was uh, a lot of fun. There's a special qualification at SkyWest and um, uh, just gave me good mountain experience, a lot of weather situations and diversions. So uh, that was a neat, neat exposure there. Um, from there, I went to Spirit Airlines where I flew the Airbus 320 family uh, aircraft and uh, based out of Fort Lauderdale, I did a lot of international flying down to Central and South America as well as uh, the Caribbean uh, throughout the uh, United States as well. So uh, that all brought me to Delta Airlines where I just started at uh, in November. Um, 
everything was uh, was going great. I just finished um, my OE, which is your initial operating experience, uh, your, your first time uh, flying the aircraft uh, outside of the simulator uh, back in uh, February, and then things kind of started to uh, to change shortly thereafter uh, for myself as well as the the entire industry. Um, so now uh, we're just kind of, uh, we being the, the junior pilots uh, at, at Delta, as well as all airlines across the U.S. and the world, are just kind of waiting to see uh, how the situation proceeds and how recovery is. Um, but for right. the time being, I'm, I'm currently uh, in, the, in the job market looking for other options because um, it seems that I'm definitely going to be getting furloughed here come October. So. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure Stephen had can talk to to what what uh, you know the ups and downs of the cyclical industry are like. Uh, but I, uh, I, I I never thought I would uh, be in this situation, especially not this soon. So it's kind of a, a a good awakening to the reality of the airline industry, which can definitely be a lot less stable in the corporate side of things. Or just the reality of careers in life, right? Right, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> Stephen, that's a perfect cue for you. Uh, you want to share a little bit of insight uh, with Jan about your experiences as uh, sure. a, a career perfect, airline pilot? Perfect segue. The, uh, the, the industry used to be, you, you, you could plot the cycles. The ups, the downs, they were just an absolute given. There were some airlines Northwest that considered uh, co-pilots or engineers just the summer help because they knew the furloughs were going to be there just rock solid and um, hmm. it, then it evolved more to a seven to 12 year cycle and that was interesting in itself because if you were at the wrong age you were going to miss the hiring period and I had good friends that were in absolute panics because they were they were old they were 35 years old and that was too old, um, you know, for the, for the conditions then. Um, we had, uh, I think we'd grown with the, uh, the, the industry, the economy, the, uh, the whole world, where we really had flattened a lot of those uh, cycles. Uh, we, had, <laughs> we had the CEO of American making statements that we'll never lose money again. Well, people got to learn to quit saying that stuff. <laughs> but... Uh, the uh, the fact of the matter is, I think it's just inescapable at some point that you know there will be the ups and downs. Uh, I was working for a travel club when I got furloughed. Um, it was actually kind of humorous, um, where uh, director of ops said we got to talk. I said, "What about?" Said, well, we're going to cut back operations. So, uh, well, that's great. He goes, "Yeah, we're going to have to furlough some crews." I go, "That's great, but we only have one crew." Yeah, we got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you know, it, it, it is unfortunately part of the, part of the uh, industry. I used to joke that the uh, ATP written ought to have questions about wiring schedule and, and use of lumber and bracing because at some point you're going to pick up a hammer and swing it to earn a living. Uh, and if you're working for an airline or any kind of certified ops, you're going to go through their training and their, their certification and testing. ATP had very little, you know, the, the FAA tickets had very little to do with it. I don't want to be discouraging that because the upside is, you find something and you'll have life experiences that you take forward and you grow with. Um, I mean, I ended up flying cattle, but I was flying a four engine jet flying cattle. And that's all that mattered. Um, I was living, you know, in a, in a, in a $200 a month flop house, basically of an apartment, but I didn't care. Um, so, uh, you know, we all have, uh, I was lucky. I didn't have a lot of luggage to tote along with me literally or figuratively. Um, I think uh, there are a couple of things I, I learned along the way. Um, most people on their way up at some point are going to be asked to compromise. And you have to decide personally what your levels of compromise are. Um, and you also have to be alive to spend it. Compromise and, in what respect? People might ask you to fly when you don't feel like flying okay fly when uh, when the definition of when you can fly might be a little bit in question 
Um, was is might, that from before, or is that as, as recent as oh, that, now? Oh, that was that was before. That was getting there. Okay. Uh, I, I I boast to people that I, I'm very happy to know that I am flying for a company that will fire me for taking a broken airplane. But that was not always the case. Gotcha. Gotcha. And in fact, when I got hired at American, this is 1985. I had uh, captains whose kids were getting into aviation and they asked for my advice. And at the time, I reached into my back pocket and I pulled out a little blue wallet that had about $1,500 in traveler's checks. Uh, Google what a traveler's check is. Anyway, um, and I said, you give them this. Because at some point, they're going to be asked to compromise and the answer is going to be no. And with $1,500 in your back pocket, you can start your way home or you can get food and shelter until someone can get you an airline ticket home. Gotcha. But you got to be alive to spend it. Yeah. You also got to be alive to starve to death. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's an interesting way to put it. Zane, but it is, but it's a matter of integrity. Yeah. It's a matter of integrity and perseverance. It's really what airlines come down to. And it's also something Bob Hoover brings to the table. If you look at his, his story, it's one of perseverance, and it's definitely one of integrity. So Very true. It's one, of, one, one of the things I liked about getting involved with the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation is it, it, it brings those things out. And aviation is an amazing media. It doesn't care who you are, what your background is, or what your culture is. There's certain truisms involving gravity and velocity. <laughs> that are inescapable. And those truths aren't gonna be bent to anyone's culture or political will or anything else. They're very, very true. And that's why you can find people from all corners of the earth, even adversarial pilots, people in the Russian Air Force have a lot in common with people in the US Air Force. Very when true. They together, when they get together and have a beer, they find they have so much in common. It's yeah, really and, and in, in talking about that, and in, in, in talking about Bob Hoover, in the stories that have been told in books written about him and the documentaries and that type of thing. He actually had mutual admiration for pilots, enemy pilots that he fought against and flew against. Um, and, and actually had an opportunity or two to meet a couple of them after the war and everything. And they still had that mutual respect. It was like, yeah, I was doing what I'm supposed to do for my country and you for yours, but you're one heck of a pilot, you know, or and, and that type yeah. of thing. So, and and I I think you bring up a great point because the camaraderie among within the aviation community is is actually actually an amazing thing in itself. So yeah. I'm we gonna we move on. We have to, one of the let ahead. me throw one more last thing in. We have the last fully accountable jobs on earth. We either do it right or we don't go home. Yeah. Earth and the sky don't care. That's a Definitely one way to put it. Yeah. So. Or, I mean, it, it, it's a very macho way of saying it. I will, you know, I'll, I'll semi-apologize for that. I guess ordnance disposal workers have the same, the same uh, parameters. But there, there really isn't, there's no rolling it into the next quarter. Uh, it's not an inherently dangerous occupation. But yeah. at the same time, if you're totally passive, you will come to grief. And in that, it's a good parallel for life. Sure. You, you can have other people suggesting things, but you have to decide and you have to act. Point well taken. I, I was going to ask you, Zane, um, you, you, you had a little bit different path uh, in the business aviation world versus airline. How did that come about? How did you end up doing what you're doing now and have been doing for a number of uh, years? Sure. Um, I've never been an airline pilot. Uh, I've never, I wasn't in the military, but a, flying is all I ever wanted to do. My mother says I didn't make a very good little league baseball player because I was busy in the outfield watching airplanes instead of fly balls. <laughs> um, and so it's all I want to do. I, I grew up in a very small rural area of central Florida, but um, I started flying in high school. I actually got my pilot, private pilot's license in high school and, and then went on to Embry-Riddle. Um, you know, I, we didn't have the instant social media and uh, internet then. So, of course, um, you had to dig a little deeper to find opportunities. And, uh, you know, everybody just talked about, uh, talked about airlines and seemed to know. 
Um, so my dad had discouraged me from trying to be a pilot because he had friends and knew people uh, that it was a cycle where airlines were furloughing. And um, um, he convinced me to start college at Embry-Riddle in aeronautical engineering. And uh, it, well, I started in a summer term and I was miserable. And I went home and told him I'm, I'm failing calculus. I couldn't even spell it. And, uh, and I want to be a pilot. Um, <laughs> I think my first um, experience out of school and, and it was just the path that led me what I'm doing is uh, I got exposed to some corporate aviation early uh, when I was flight instructing and, and at the job uh, where I was, they were flying an old uh, Sabre liner, a couple of Sabre liners, and I got to fly as a, as a, as a co-pilot. And that fit my personality. I, I, I think I'm a people person. And so I like to know what's going on with my company. I like to have a relationship with the people that are in the back of the airplane, um, more so than just greeting them at the door, I guess. Um, and so I ended up, uh, I've only had a few jobs in, in my career. Um, uh, you know, I've been in aviation now for 40 years, if you count when I, when I started flying, over 40 years, I guess. And uh, I've only had a few jobs and the, my current job, I've been here 27 years, which is um, sometimes an anomaly for a corporate uh, flying job. Um, but, but I've landed at a good company with, uh, with solid leadership at the company that views airplanes not as a toy. They don't view airplanes as a luxury for um, just flying senior executives. They're viewed as a piece of equipment that we use in the furtherance of our business, just like we use equipment to get chickens from the, from the, from the chicken house into the plant, or just like we use machinery in, the, in our plant. We use airplanes for the furtherance uh, of our business. Um, and to some of the other things that were said about integrity and, um, and compromise, I'll echo that uh, to you young guys of, um, you know, don't, uh, don't compromise yourself, set some standards. And, you know, one of the things, at least I think when some of us older guys were coming up and, and uh, things weren't quite as um, regulated is not the word, but um, uh, it was a little more cowboyish sometimes that I, I've actually heard, you know, people would say, well, if you can't do this or won't do this, there are plenty of people that will. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, um, there are other professions that you get your education and you get your degree and you get your credentials and you go out and hang your shingle and, and you start work. And in aviation, getting your, your degree and getting your um, licenses is really now your license to learn. And it takes experience. It takes time in the cockpit. It takes time to learn and before you're insurable, before people will start, before you can be a, a pilot in command. And, and so it sometimes gets um, uh, to be a race for building that flight time and, and people can be um, talked into sometimes doing, putting yourself in a situation maybe you don't wanna be. So, um, you know, I hear people say in our, for us, uh, you know, well, safety is our number one priority. Well, no, it's not. Getting our people from point A to point B in the safest manner possible is our priority. If okay. safety was our number one priority, I think we'd keep the airplane in the hangar and keep the doors closed. <laughs> so our number one priority is getting our passengers where they need to be, when they need to be there, in the safest, most efficient manner that we can. And that's our job as the pilot or the flight attendant or the maintenance people to make sure that happens. Um, so I've been lucky, or my company supports that 100%. And um, it, it's not the career path, I think, in aviation that, that I had nailed down from, from day one, but it's one that evolved for me, and it's one that I'm very happy with, and, uh, and I, I don't think I would trade it. So you, your operation is unique to a number of corporate operations and not, you know, some of the uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, with what you guys do. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your daily and weekly mission uh, with your aircraft and, and, and who you fly and how you do it? Sure. We don't, uh, you know, you don't build a chicken plant uh, in a major metropolitan area. They tend to be rural. Our home 
uh, our home, our headquarters. I'm in Laurel, Mississippi. And, um, you know, the closest viable commercial airports to us are, we have, there are two in their different directions and they're an hour and a half drive away. So uh, our, our, some of our plants, literally for people to get there, they could drive the eight or nine hours in a car quicker than they can do the airline trip. By the time you drive to the airport, get there an hour early, you have to go to Atlanta or Dallas and connect. And, and it's so, <clears throat> so what we do is a lot of our airplanes <clears throat> will launch at seven to eight o'clock in the morning at our hangar. It's not uncommon for us to have 40 or 50 people um, at our facility, at our hangar facility in the morning. Uh, we launch out airplanes. Uh, going to our our facilities where we have have uh, operations, and we we have everybody on board. Sometimes from uh, maybe a truck driver that needs to be a bring a truck back from there. We may have the the president of the company on the plane. We have mostly mid level people. Very seldom do we have upper management on our on our airplane. So, uh, sixty percent or so of our flying is in support of just company day-to-day -day operations. Uh, of course, we fly customers. We bring customers into our facilities to, um, to see their product running, to see what we do, to see how we run our operation. They may need to bring people in for a quality control audit, those sorts of things. Um, we, fly, uh, we fly humanitarian flights. That, that's always in the news for, for corporate aviation. And uh, we provide seats on our airplanes for people that may be traveling to, uh, to a hospital or for cancer treatments, things like that. So um, it's, uh, it's not scheduled. It's not like an airline where we know a pilot knows um, way out in advance. They did a schedule a, a month in advance or so. Uh, we are unique in that we give our pilots, uh, you know, so many guaranteed hard days off every month and they know those a year and they do know those days a year in advance and they can plan out around that. Um, but it's, it's, it's all domestic U.S. Um, our flights are about, we average about an hour stage length per flight. And, um, uh, we're, our guys are home most every night. That's a big draw here for our pilots is they work hard. They fly a lot. Our average pilot's flying about 500 hours a year, which is a lot for a corporate wow. flight department. That is. That's um, a busy flight. But, wow. but they're home almost every night. They're home sleeping in their own bed. So that's a, that's a big draw for guys. Wow. So uh, Matthew and Otto, in particular, you guys are your seniors at Embry-Riddle and Prescott, uh, finishing up your your education and flight training, uh, and you've heard from both the airline side and the corporate side. So what kind of thoughts are you having or questions or, or comments about what you've heard so far? Um, well, I've been interested in corporate um, my whole life, basically. My dad flew corporate, as well as cargo and airlines. So I've kind of got to hear a lot about each of them from him. And I've always wanted to do car or corporate based on the like I said before, the closer relationship with who you're flying, who you're working for. And, you know, the schedule might vary a little more than airlines, but I think um, at a younger age, that would be um, totally fine for being on the move all the time. I think that would be cool. And um, maybe eventually move into cargo and just kind of see where it goes, start flying bigger airplanes maybe, and uh, just kind of get a feel for everything. So, so you have you have flying in your blood. Your 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 dad and and I believe you said your grandfather also. Yeah, my grandfather flew in the Air Force and had his own private airplanes, as well as my dad. So, uh, so you you've grown up in aviation. Yeah, definitely. And you want to continue that legacy. Yep, I've always wanted to follow in their footsteps, and it's always what I wanted to do. That's awesome, uh, Matthew. How about you? Well, for me, uh, it's kind of an interesting story. So last summer, I actually entered at an airline, got a little bit more experience in, you know, the corporate world, not corporate aviation. It was, uh, you know, 121 carrier. And it was kind of cool to see all the different teams that work together to make an airline work and actually see what the insides look like and how that works. But I also like to stay open. I, I don't want to say that I want to go straight to the airlines. I don't want to say if I want to go to the airlines directly. 
I kind of want to keep my options available for if any opportunities come up. Because I know like corporate aviation, a lot of times it's something that you don't really pursue. It pursues, it pursues you, you find a company finds you that you with that reputation, maybe even that networking that you have with those people that you know. Um, I guess something that I could actually ask uh, maybe uh, Tamara or Zane is uh, how, how do you find a pilot that's set aside or how do you find a pilot that is set apart from other pilots that would be something that you would look for in like corporate aviation or uh, in your uh, realm of work you're working in? I, I, will, I will say, and I don't want this to sound cavalier, but, you know, every every once in a while, I remember when I was at Embry-Riddle, you know, every once in a while you get the guy that that uh, forgets to take his Ray-Bans off when he's in class, you know, he's got that <laughs> cool, I'm a pilot factor, and um, and and while it's a special profession, it, it, it's, we love to do it, and it's, and it's hard work, uh, and it takes perseverance, if somebody gets a little too big for their britches, I guess. I remind pilot, the, some of my guys sometimes that the first people to fly spaceships were monkeys and German shepherds. So, <laughs> you know, on some level, you can, you can teach people how to do it, but you can't change a person's personality. And um, this is in no way a, a, a knock on airline aviation, but I think that in some ways personality is a bigger factor for a corporate pilot because you interact face to face with senior leadership in your company. You interact face to face with the CEO, with all these people, and you, and and it takes some personality. So, to me, by the time somebody gets the requirements to come to work for me, and we've said at our company, it's you know you have to have your ATP, you have to have X number of thousands of hours of flight time and and multi engine time and those things. And I do some checks on you and, uh, you know, I can, I see that you know what you're doing. By the time you get to that level, you've proven that you know what you're doing. And what I'm looking for now is your personality. Are you going to fit with my company? Are you going to fit with the, the way that we work and the way that we have to, to fly? And, and another part is location. Again, I'm in rural Mississippi. You know, so honestly, I have I have a couple of guys that work for me, both in maintenance and pilots that are Embry-Riddle graduates. But I also have a large contingent here in our state. We have a school, uh, Delta State, uh, here in Mississippi that has a commercial aviation program. So I have a number of guys uh, that are from there. So we also look for why would you want to be in Mississippi? So a lot of my guys have ties here. They have ties to this state or this part of the country. They may have family around and they want to say, if I get a resume from a guy from Southern California who's, you know, 35 years old and he's got 10 type ratings already, I kind of know what's going on there. He's going to come to me to get a G280 type rating and in a little while he's going to be gone somewhere else. So um, those are the things that that we look for once you get beyond the basic um, technical requirements is is your aptitude to work with us your personality so one of the questions uh, i think they bring up a great point by the way I, i've talked with a number of uh directors of flight departments like yourself uh and that's generally what they say in terms of new hires they're looking for somebody personality wise that fits they can meet all the qualifications have the type ratings etc but it's more of fitting the team and fitting the, the uh, culture of the company, et cetera, and so forth. So I think that's a great point that you share with everybody. Uh, but one of the questions, and this is not to put you on the spot, Zane, but I hear this all the time about the challenges of breaking into corporate aviation or business aviation coming fresh out of school. Um, what, what, do you, what, what thoughts do you have about that? What recommendations do you have um, for for these seniors that are getting ready to graduate or, um, you know, those. Who yeah. Are um, you know, that is tough. I mean, because for, for most, uh, corporate flight departments, I think, uh, like mine, the, the, the hiring requirements as far as flight time are going to be higher maybe, um, than they are say at a regional airline. Um, even though those have increased, you know, with the new regulations in the last few years. Um, 
a, a lot of it, you know, we've had some guys with, with um, low time that have just made connections with us, either, either through an internship or through um, just being from the area. And, and you stay in touch with those guys. Uh, we have a fellow that, uh, that I know that um, was from this area and, and he did that. And, and we told him, look, at that time, your goal, you've got to get multi-engine time and you've got to get turbine time. And what's the best way right now? Now this was pre-COVID. What's the best way to do that? Is, is just bite the bullet and go to a regional airline. Even if you don't think you want to be an airline pilot, that's a quick way to get within a couple of years to get quality multi-engine turbine time, but also to learn to work in a crew environment, to learn cockpit resource management, to learn all of those things. Um, so I'm going to say we've gone both ways. I have had pilots over the years that have left me and gone to uh, major airlines. I have some guys that, that I still keep in touch with all the time that have, have gone to Federal Express. That's only, that's just, you know, a few, a few hours drive from us. So I've had guys go to both uh, FedEx uh, mainline. I've had guys go into their uh, corporate flight department at FedEx. Uh, but I've also got uh, probably half a dozen pilots that are former airline pilots and they've come the other direction. You know, the airline, uh, the airline just didn't work for them. They didn't like that kind of schedule environment, whatever. It's, you know, again, it's, it's a different stroke for different folks and they found a home here. They've come the other direction and, and they like it better here. So, um, I, you know, right now everything is so uh, up in the air with, yes. with, uh, with coronavirus yeah. that, that I don't know what, what those answers, you know, when uh, Stephen and I were younger, the ways that guys would build flight time would be uh, you flew checks, you know, again, at Google, what's a check, right? So, you know, that was, a, that was a lot. Everybody flew checks around at night and things like that to build time that those opportunities aren't, aren't really there anymore. Um, I really feel like flight instructing is a valuable uh, occupation when you're starting out. Um, I think I learned more in the first six months of being a flight instructor than I had learned up to that time about aviation. When I, when I teach to somebody else, it gives a great, gives you a great background and a great uh, a baseline to be on. Sure. I, Actually, I, I, I think I'm sorry, did. Vince. Go, no, go can ahead, I, Tamara. Go can ahead. I add a little to this? Yes, um, please. To Matthew's question. I will tell you, it's get de attention to detail first. But when I I wanted was looking to get out at ten years from the Air Force because that's always the mark, and I knew nothing about the corporate world. And for you, Jan, I like with Delta, nine eleven happened, and I was like, oh, I better stick where I'm at because <laughs> it's not a good time. So I always right. believe when one door closes, ten more doors open. So there's always going to be 10 more opportunities that you didn't know about to keep it on a positive thought. But uh, in the corporate world, to me, it's, you're, it's like sales. You're the person, you're the product. So when you're doing that, when I see a good pilot, I'm with Zane, it is your personality. And to me, good pilots, you can land a plane perfectly but if you cannot communicate with your crew and you and that's you know your crew resource management and you see your CRM you're not a good pilot if if you can ask how people are doing or anything else what good are you because that's when safety comes into it but attention to detail when I see someone and you can't you know, iron your shirt or anything, because it's always attention. I mean, that was taught to us in the military. And anything on the plane, I will tell you, one time we had to do a cruise swap on an aircraft. Attention to detail, because we didn't want to tell the press right away. We took pictures of how their seats were, so we could replicate it on the other aircraft to make sure we'd done it. Now, we did let them know, because we figured they'd check the tail number but we told the president first but that attention to detail no one had known that we had done it so we told the president first and then he goes yes go ahead and tell the press so it's always attention to detail well definitely as basic as when i teach at the school protocol 
and etiquette, when you go to dinner, that's still your interview. If you can't eat properly and that you just interview thinking, oh, I, I've got this job. No, how you eat can affect everything. So. No, that's, yes, that's, that's great input on that. What I was going to do is I, I was going to ask Jan. Jan, you have an impressive background with coming out of school and going right into flying. With what we're talking about today, how did you how did you manage that path? Because I mean, you 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 went to several different operations and finally got to uh, Delta, which I would I would gather would be an operation you're happy to be at in terms of the size of the airline, et cetera, and so forth. But you you had a path going there. Can you share that with us about what your thought process was and how you did that? Yeah, and I was actually thinking of this uh, when Matthew was uh, was speaking and uh, about an interest in corporate uh, aviation as well as the airlines, because that's exactly the position I found myself in uh, when I graduated from Embry Riddle. And so I was fortunate to find a low time opportunity. I got hired at Tradewind Aviation with about 600 hours. And I bridged the gap between um, between about the 250 hours that I finished my flight training with and those 600 hours uh, with um, a friend of mine and I, we owned an old 1969 Piper Cherokee. So we flew that all around the US. Um, so that that in and of itself was a great experience that helped me get the, the time I needed to be able to start at, uh, at that corporate operation, or I'm sorry, that um, part 135 operation. But I think that just uh, realizing that you don't always have to do the route that most people do, which is uh, getting your flight training, getting your certified flight instructor, your CFI, and then instructing until you get the flight time to go to a regional airline and proceeding from there, uh, I think opens up so many more options for you. If uh, uh, Sure, you might need to get your CFI to instruct for a little bit to get some hours or uh, find another way. But if you can find a job that'll hire you with 250 hours, I think it's invaluable uh, to have the opportunity to try something new. I know there's so w even if it's something like uh, aerial surveying or, um, you know, just small cargo operation. Banner flying. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they all really open your eyes to the, you know, you get to talk to so many people who have forged a different path. And so that's what I found uh, when I was uh, at Tradewind Aviation, um, the part 135 operation, it, it really opened my eyes to so many different possibilities. And it did solidify that my, sentiment that I did want to end up at the airline just from a schedule perspective and from a, uh, I, I, an opportunity, you know, um, yeah, re really the opportunity to go where you want, whether it would different bases and all that, you don't, you're not locked into one place. And that's what attracted me to it. And I think uh, it really made my mind up when I went to, uh, to the, uh, to be able to see both sides, but kind of like what Zane was saying, um, you you kind of sometimes do have to go to the regional airlines to build the experience to go corporate. And I think that's a good thing almost because it lets you see, okay, this definitely isn't for me or, Hey, maybe the, I do like the airlines more than I thought I would. So you get to kind of see if the corporate size right for you or if the airlines are something you'd like more. Um, but yeah, I mean, all I would recommend is just to kind of try and break that mold of, of staying a CFI until you go to the regionals and try and uh, experiment with another part of the aviation industry because there's just so many jobs out there, uh, so many opportunities to, to try. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's good. Did somebody else want to chime in about that? Well, you know, we, we, um, we talk about pilots a lot here, but, you know, people that are watching this, remember there are a lot of other people in aviation, there are maintenance people, flight attendants, there are baggage handlers, there are ground marshalers, there are schedulers, dispatchers, weather people, there, there are a lot of other functions that go Absolutely. along with that. Now you guys remember in corporate aviation, if Steven lined up all the people that helped him get his airplane moving, <laughs> there'd just be a, a, a whole Hardy. panel back behind him. Um, I'm a larger flight department, so I do have a little more resource than a lot out there. But in most uh, places when you're flying a corporate jet, especially if it's a, a, a private individual or a small company, um, you can fit them all on one screen because it's going to be you. You're going to be the baggage handler. You're going to be the weatherman. You're going to be the flight attendant. You're going to be the, the everything. And, um, and that's okay. 
that's okay. That fits a lot of people's uh, personality and, and what they want to do. Um, but remember, it's, it's hard work. All of it is hard work. We love what we're doing, um, but, but, you, but you get there. Um, and I'll go back to what you said when you get some of these, uh, the places and, and your, your low time. And um, one of the fortunate things, I think, for me is my company doesn't make money with airplanes per se. That's not, we're not a, we're not a profit center aviation. Um, some of these things Steve and I were talking about earlier with integrity and things go with, uh, you know, a lot of companies that their airplanes are how they make money. Um, then there's more pressure to, um, to fly, to do things. Uh, it's tough in my job when you have to tell your CEO, uh, we're not going to go, we're not going to take you there. We've had, I've had several times over the years with, with, CEO of my company when he's wanted to go somewhere at an airport and I've researched that and I said you know there we're not going to go there there's this other place it's just it's just a, a few miles down the road or whatever and he says well they told me other jets go in other jets land there well I understand that but we're not going to and <laughs> and you know what a lot of people a lot of people I think in in corporate aviation, especially starting out, they're afraid to tell the boss that. They're afraid to tell the boss, no, we're not going to do that. And because they think, well, it's it's his airplane. He's paying my salary. He, I can I need to say these things. So remember, guys, when you're out there and starting out, that a lot of these people are 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 they're trusting you. And I think until you stand up and say no. They assume that it's okay, and and you have to justify that. You have to have a professional reason why we're why we don't need to be doing this. But um, uh, those are those are things that you're going to encounter in corporate aviation, maybe that are that are different uh, in in airline type flying. I think that those are great points that you bring up about that, Zane. Uh, Tamara, I was going to come back to you uh, and and uh, piggybacking a little bit off of what Zane was saying. Uh, about the, the team, about the, that there are so many different facets uh, of flying beyond what the pilot does to the maintenance, uh, et cetera, and so forth. You've had a lot of experience with that. Do you want to share a little bit about your, a little of your insight on that? Uh, sure. So working as a team, that's what gets any trip successful. I tease the pilots a lot. I say, this trip's gonna make it whether, you always land perfectly, but it's the personality between the maintenance getting us off, but you know, my contact with, if I'm smiling at the passengers and they get off happily, then it's good. But um, nothing's successful on our own. We have to do it together, right? So we trust our maintenance guys that everything's safe and I trust you guys that you get the plate going. But we have to work together. We have to understand our positions and kind of what our jobs are. So what I would tell you guys coming in, ask, ask about their jobs and learn their, what they do besides, I'm just the pilot I fly, I don't care what, what else they're doing. Cause you want to have an understanding of what's going on outside of your perception of just what's in the flight in the flight deck because sure. that's what is going to keep it cohesive and making the trip successful every single time. Uh, there's been, it's when even for Zane, like if a maintenance issue and like for us, anytime we had a cruise or, you know, swap planes for maintenance issues, we did it as a group. Everyone pitched in. I can tell you now from years of having to load bags, I'm very good at loading bags on a, <laughs> on a golf stream and I'm teaching pilots how to load bags because I'm like, you're killing me because they don't, that's not, you know, they're like, ah, oh, we just put it on the couch. It'll be okay. And I'm like, no, I have to make beds. Let me, let me show you a good trick. But it's building that communication and that teamwork. And especially if you do contracting, it's a, you'll get a lot of experience versus just going to work and it's going to be good and bad experience but you just go in i'm going in to get that experience because some accounts are like this is how we do it just keep quiet and do it or some are you got to go in with confidence and go 
let me help you because this is going to help but do it in a present it in a way that you know they're confident that you are really helping them but it's learning the different procedures and being able to communicate and work together uh, definitely if you can do contract it it'll open your eyes to so many things but it's always having to work as a team because if you're not it's that that communication that'll hurt in the end so so not to move it into anything really super controversial but i wanted to take advantage of having you here tamara and ask you uh as a female in the industry and you've been in the air force you've worked corporate um so you you've kind of seen it all and there's a lot of talk about the lack of diversification and in your case that would be gender diversification what, what what's your observations about that maybe you know what are some of the challenges that you think still exist uh in that arena definitely for i've seen it improve for like female pilots working as what we call the uh, sam or distinguished visitor working for special missions on your Gulf Streams and your Boeing aircraft of doing that. Mm -hmm. There are limited female pilots out there. Um, they're more, it's, they're tough. Um, other pilots, when they do their check rides and all that, they're tough, tougher on them, but they go in, these female pilots go in going, I got this. It's gotten better over the years. You're seeing more female pilots now than when I first started flying. 95. Uh, on the corporate side, I, I've seen a lot of more female pilots out there. I, I won't, I will say like on, a, on the flight attendant side, they always say, oh, flight attendants, they're a drama all the time. And that's really not the truth. Honestly, if all of us flight attendants talked about work and who we're flying, what we're doing, we could rule the world because we never really, we were very private about who we're flying and what we're doing. That um, when we do go, oh, I was, I was in Kansas. Oh, I was in Kansas. And we don't talk about who we're flying or anything. But then when we realize we're like, oh, that's what was going on. We could rule the world then. <laughs> but, and it's not really a lot of drama. We communicate a lot better. And the, some pilots who do know us, they're like, oh, who, we need this or that. And we stay in touch a lot better than that. But no, it's getting better than good it was in the past. Yeah, good. Listen, we're running out of time. It's been, been such a great conversation, but we're going to have to wrap it up in a couple of minutes. But I'd like to give everybody an opportunity, uh, particularly our seasoned uh, aviation industry veterans, to, to give some closing comments. And, uh, uh, directed at, at our, you know, young aviation professionals and those that are interested in it. I'll start with you, Stephen. Well, I think we've already alluded to it. Aviation is an immensely human endeavor. Um, as <laughs> it's already been mentioned, the first astronauts were animals. Anybody can fly them. It takes a real human being to work with others to get things done. Even the Wright brothers had help in the beginning. It is not a solo occupation. You need to ask questions. You need to respect everybody that you're coming in contact with. Now, some folks will be doing the best they ever can. You also see that some folks, this is their starting point. They might be slinging bags now, but they're going to be managing cargo services in five years or seven years. They, they, people have enormous potential until you get out there working shoulder to shoulder and after a little while, you'll see people grow. Yourself, others, they all have potential. They all have growth. And you ask questions, you'll get a lifetime of experience back. And, you know, when I got on, when I got hired to the airlines, I'd, I'd get on a new piece of equipment. I'd ask the captain, what have your engine problems been? And in 30 seconds, I got 20,000 hours of experience handed to me just for simply asking a question. So communication is, is key. One real quick technical point, if someone invites you to the interview, relax. You've got the experience they need. Now they're looking at the person. They are looking at the person. They are not gonna waste time calling an unqualified person to the interview. So relax and uh, enjoy it. 
Yeah. Enjoy Thank you the choices. Much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Tamara? Um, based, I'm with Stephen. Ask questions. Talk to everyone. Talk to every crew position. Be yourself, but be confident and proud. Attention to detail. And keep learning. Set yourself apart. That's the best way. Thank you. Uh, and Zane? Yeah, uh, I'll echo the same as learn your craft, whether it's piloting or maintenance or, or those things. And, and then uh, keep your options open. The aviation for you young people out there, aviation is, is, is so full of opportunities in a vast array of, um, of jobs. I had dinner last night with a fella that, um, that was in the, went in the military out of high school. We got out and then he went to work for a major cargo carrier on the ramp, handling baggage, went back to college, got a law degree and had a career with that same cargo airline as an attorney, as a business attorney. <laughs> so there was an opportunity that a lot of people may never have thought about that, that it was in aviation, but it had nothing to do with flying or maintaining airplanes. It was as an attorney. So um, broaden your horizons, keep your eyes open, learn your craft and have a great time. Wow, you guys have said it all. I'll, I'll just cap it off with saying, I always make the recommendation that with whatever, uh, aviation job you, you get an opportunity with at whatever level, always make yourself uh, available. Um, the, the person that says yes when it's a, a difficult assignment or an assignment at an odd time at three o'clock in the morning or uh, last minute or things like that that says yes, then the head of that operation always thinks of that person first and they're also gonna think of that person when they're promoting people um, or, or, or giving them special assignments and things like that. They're going to think of the person that said yes, not the one that said, well, uh, not this time. So you might want to keep that in mind because I think that's a, a big plus for your career. This has been a great conversation. We could probably could have gone a lot longer, but uh, time, has time has done what it's done to us. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to, to, to thank everyone for, for being on the program. Steven, thank you. You were a bit of a last minute ad and I appreciate that. Uh, have fun with your triple seven, uh, triple seven flying uh, for another couple of months. Um, Zane, uh, a wealth of information. And of course you and I uh, know each other from the National Business Aviation Association uh, and, and your uh, intricate involvement with them and that type of thing. So thank you for, for sharing uh, all your expertise. Tamara, you and I go back, <laughs> met on a Southwest Airlines flight, and then on our way, both of us on the way to an MBAA convention, uh, and have been friends ever since. And, and thank you again for providing um, um, uh, Air Force One M&Ms for my daughters. Uh, they used <laughs> to get a kick out of that back in the day. <laughs> so, uh, but no, it's been great. And you, you, uh, uh, you, you brought a wealth of information to this conversation too, and you're still doing some great things after you, long after your retirement from the Air Force. So that's pretty impressive in itself. And for the young crew, you guys are doing some amazing things. John, you're, you're well on your way and, and really um, uh, seem to have a handle on the, on the industry and, and, and what to do with it and that type of thing. So wish you well with Delta and, and, and on and above that. Uh, Matthew, um, and Otto, you guys are finishing up your training in your school and, and figuring out your next path, but you know, it's clear to me that you guys are going to do well. So, uh, again, thank you all for being on the program. Uh, again, this is on, on behalf of the Bob Hoover Legacy Foundation, All Things Aviation, and one of the big uh, uh, initiatives uh, that we do in conjunction with the Citation Jet Pilots Association is provide scholarships um, for aviation specific scholarships for the education and, uh, and furthering of the careers in aviation. And we, we'd like to continue doing that and appreciate everybody's support with regard to that. So we thank you and we look forward to seeing you guys on the next program uh, next Thursday. Everybody have a good one and uh, take care. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thanks.